At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time. But once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion. And if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us so that in the service time when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. Have you ever had one of those arguments that was totally over something completely trivial? You know, like which way the toilet paper goes? You know what I'm talking about? Those kind of arguments. Or, or, or apparently there is a correct method to put dishes in the dishwasher. Did you know this? I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, we had a couple of those early in our marriage, my wife and I. This is a, a picture of her. Where do I point this thing? Let's see if I can figure that out. There we go. This is a picture. Of, this is my wife, Shaughnessy. Uh, Shaughnessy, and uh, early in our marriage, we had a couple of those trivial arguments, you know, where you're just entrenched. I'm not budging, and the topic is so silly, right? So we had to outlaw Monopoly. That was one of them. Anybody else have to do that? That is rough, okay? That game is rough. I'm pretty sure that just is intended to destroy people, all right? But the second one was really revealing to me. Um, we had just moved, and she had spent all day unpacking boxes in the kitchen, trying to get things set for me and the kids, and just so I could come home from work, and we could go right into dinner and be smooth and feel more like home. And I got home, and I saw how hard she had worked all day, and that she had just put a ton of effort in this. She was clearly exhausted, and I was so grateful, right? And then I went to the kitchen to get a cup. I went to the cupboard that the cups go in. You know, the cupboard that God intended the cups to go in, okay? The cupboard on the left-hand side of the sink, right? And what's in front of my face? Plates. Where's my water supposed to go? <laughs> Plates. And I said, um, babe, where'd you put the cups? She's like, well, I, I put them over on the right-hand side. I thought they'd fit better and just kind of look nicer over here. I said, Oh my gosh, who did I marry? <laughs> she puts her cups over here. What? This is crazy. This is bordering on sin right now. Like, I am not sure how this is going to go. And this is what it went against everything from my childhood. I felt like this is attacking my childhood. The cups have always gone on the left hand side. And I just felt like, this is not home. What? And so I said, um, Why'd you do that? Oh, <laughs> Don't ask that question, fellas. Don't ask that question. Why'd you do that? And she caught my tone, and she said, she put her hands on her hips. She's got a little sass, just a little bit. She said, because I wanted to. <laughs> oh, now we're entrenched, right? We are not budging, right? This is the cupboard wars. This is, there, nobody's coming to the middle, right? Needless to say, I, uh, I lost that war. We are a home that keeps our cups on the right-hand side of the sink, and we are happy about it. <laughs> okay? But, but although the topic was trivial, it revealed something in me, something that um, I didn't realize before. I am really bad at resolving conflict. And you know, if I'm honest with you guys, every time I go to the cupboard, and there's a little twinge in my heart, I was right. She was wrong. <laughs> I'm not proud of that, but that's the reality of what's going on in my heart. And it revealed, I am not good at resolving conflict. Today, we're going to continue our series of Becoming, and we're going to be looking at some, some of what I believe is the most difficult commands in Scripture when it comes to conflict and relationships. We're going to be in Romans 12, verses 17 and 18. If you've got your Bibles open to those two verses, that's what we'll be tonight. This is what it says. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now this was written by a guy named Paul, not Pastor Paul. He's not that old, okay? Paul the Apostle, okay? And uh, a little bit about Paul. He was a Jewish man, a renowned Jewish man, who originally persecuted the church. He, he hated Christians. And uh, he has this radical encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus where he gets these scales on his eyes, he can't see, he's totally humbled, he surrenders his life to God, and he begins following Jesus. And here's God's plan for his life. You're going to be a Jewish man, the apostle to the Gentiles. What? 
Those two groups don't like each other. This is a bad plan, God. But he goes and he, he is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's sent to the Gentiles and he's persecuted by his own people. Paul was a man whose life was marked by suffering. Five times he received the 40 lashes minus one. He was beaten with, raw, with rods. He was imprisoned for his faith. And towards, at the end of his life, he was beheaded. Most uh, extra biblical historians say that he was beheaded for his faith under Emperor Nero. So Paul is a guy who knows how to live this out. When the evil comes against him, how to respond appropriately. And he's writing to people who need to hear this. You see, the Roman church for about 15 years were going through some intense persecution. Under Emperor Claudius, uh, he actually expulsed all of the Jews from Rome, including Jewish Christians. And what he did effectively was take the, the churches that were made up of Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, and he ordered a state-sponsored church split by shoving them out of Rome. These people had lost people that they were in the fight with. These people knew what it meant to experience evil. And they needed to hear what Paul had to say about responding appropriately. Not only that, but after Claudius died, Emperor Nero, um, he was a very evil man. He used Christians as a, a sport, essentially. He would host circuses where he would feed them to the lions. He would use them to light his gardens. And I don't mean that they lit the candles, I mean that they were the candles. And so this is a time where Paul is writing to a situation that they desperately need to hear. When the wrong comes against me, how do I respond? And you see, we don't have the same persecution. But the root issue is still the, the same. We are all sinful, and if we have a pulse, we're going to have conflict. So how do we, how do we resolve? How do, when the sin is done against us, how do we resolve it? My goal for us here tonight, today, this weekend, is that we would leave here with a greater ability to resolve the conflicts in our life. So he says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. First thing I want you to see in this passage is we are called in the midst of conflict to become self-controlled. To become self-controlled. Don't just take my word for it. Let's look at it in the passage. It says, do not repay I want you to underline or circle that word repay. That is your response. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay. Our proper response to evil, to sin, to injustice, to wrong done against us should not ever be in kind. It should never be a response that says, I'm going to really let them have it. But isn't that where our hearts go? When the pain is real, when it's raw, when it is hurting, the emotions are very uh, short, and, and, and we want to respond with, with oh, I want to let him have it. So how, how do we do this? How do we become self-controlled in the midst of conflict? And I love how he says, he doesn't give anybody an out. He says, your response should not be evil, no matter who it is. Do not repay anyone. Think about what this meant to the church that this was written to. Under, under Nero, under Nero's Rome, when, when your friends are taken and used as torches, don't, don't repay in kind. See, it could be that one week Bob is in church and the next week, nope, he's gone, he died because of the persecution they were experiencing. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. It doesn't matter if they're your friend or your family. A stranger, your enemy. Get this, it doesn't matter if they are a believer or an unbeliever. Don't repay anyone. And then he doesn't even define what evil is. You know, it'd be really great if he said, don't repay white lies with evil. Or, or the minor offenses. But he says, regardless of what the offense is, don't repay in kind. And don't we have a sliding scale? These, the white lies are down here, and I can kind of let that go to the side. 
And then the hiddenness and deception is up here. And the murder's up here. And we have this sliding scale that says, there are offenses I will let aside, especially if I know the person. But his call is, regardless of who they are, regardless of the offense, we are called to not respond in kind. How do you get there? How can you become self-controlled in the midst of conflict? This is a picture of my, my kids, uh, Asher and Audra. I wish they were always like this, but that is not the reality in our home. Um, Asher and Audra. So we uh, recently, we moved to the, the green area in the last couple of years, and we were so excited to be closer to our church. And um, the first week we were there, we were unpacking, and I hear in the back of the house, Asher's got his own room, and he's so excited because before he had to share it with two girls, okay? That was a nightmare for him. I hear the most blood-curdling scream ever, okay? You would think somebody had passed away. So I was terrified. I'm on the other end of the house, run down there, and I find out Audra, my, my uh, youngest, had taken a cup, you know, one of those little Dutch Bros cups with the straw, and placed it next to Asher's bed. Uh-oh. This is bad. This is his territory. And he, he responds with, Audra, you can't do that. This is my space. Dad said this was a safe place for me. And Audra, she's a little sassy girl, and uh, she puts her hands on her hips too. And she says, I can't if I want to. <laughs> I can't if I want to, Right? And I'm like, thanks, sis. Asher was up here. He was already near a 10. With your sassiness, we're now at like a 12. And so what do you think Asher does? He goes, he picks up the cup. He's like, dude, I'm going to take this to a whole nother level. This cup is not going to be in my room anymore. Goes in the bathroom, opens the toilet, throws it in the toilet, and flushes. You guys, he flushed the toilet with the cup in it. Now, praise God, the cup was too big to go down the drain. But the straw wasn't. And needless to say, we had some plumbing issues for quite a while there. And I pulled Asher aside after that, and I said, a simple question. Hey, buddy, what could you have done differently in this, in this situation? It seems like it kind of got out of control. You, know, you were here, and then here, and then here, and we're just going to keep one-upping each other until somebody is bleeding or seriously injured, you know? And I said, what could you have done differently? And he said, but Dad, she wouldn't listen to me. This is my spot. I said, okay, bud. I totally get what you're feeling angry. What could you have done differently, though? And he said, Dad, she put her cup by my bed. Like, this is the most grievous offense she could have ever done, right? I said, I understand what you're feeling. What could you have done differently? And then he didn't really want to say it, but he mumbles. He's like, well, I guess I could have been more nice about it. And I'm like, what was that, buddy? I guess I could have been more nice about asking her to move her cup. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. What else could you have done different? Well, I know sometimes when I'm angry, um, I don't say words that are kind, and I probably should have just walked away and prayed to Jesus and asked him for help. Oh, that's great, buddy. Yeah, for sure. So next time, are you going to do those two things? He said, yeah. You know what he realized? In the midst of the conflict, he could have had a plan as to how to handle the conflict. You see, I believe if we are going to be self-controlled in conflict, we have got to have a plan. That's not a blank on your outline, but I encourage you to write that down. In the midst of your conflict, if you do not have a plan, it will not go well for you. You see, my wife and I are very different. I'm a fixer. I want to fix the problem right now, and I'm going to ask you 50 questions until we get it resolved. And she is a processor. She takes some time. She needs to evaluate, why do I feel the way I feel? See, I, I have, I'm an emotional dude. I'm like an emotional roller coaster, to be honest with you guys. And I know every reason why I'm feeling what I'm feeling. And Shaughnessy, when she's feeling hurt or upset or angry, she doesn't always know where it's tied to or what, what the infraction was. And we realized a couple years into our marriage, we process conflict differently and we're going to have to figure this out. And so we sat down and we came up with a plan and ours looks like this. If at any point in the conflict, she says, I need an hour 
or can we revisit this, this, this afternoon? I must drop it, okay? I must drop I cannot continue to ask questions. She can't address it any further. We walk away, we pray, and we will come back after the time that, that's been agreed upon. And for us, that was a game changer because it allowed her to process, and it was important for me to know we are going to come back to this but you have got to have a plan. And a couple of things I would encourage you um, in your plan. Know when to walk away. Know when to walk away. Have a safe phrase or statement that says, I need time right now. I love you enough to tell you I need to walk away from this situation because I'm not going to resolve it. I'm afraid if we don't have a plan, we'll walk into it and we will just make a bigger mess. Know when you need to walk away and come back to it later. The second thing, and I think this is so crucial and important for any relationship, um, in the midst of conflict is a powerful question. What I hear you saying is, am I correct? Those two statements, because what happens, at least for me, in the midst of conflict, is I am hearing through the filter of anger, frustration, sadness, whatever it is I'm, I'm experiencing emotionally, I am hearing through that filter, and I am not hearing her correctly. And the simple question, what I hear you saying is this. Am I correct? And then she can either clarify or affirm You know what it does? It helps you address the problem, not the perceived problem. And the last thing I would encourage you is to pray. And if I'm honest with you guys, when I'm in the midst of conflict, that's the last thing I want to do. But when you pray, you're talking to a God who loves that person way better than you can. And if you just surrender yourself in prayer and say, God, I want to love them. We are in conflict. Please help me love them. The Lord will help you in the midst of your conflict to love them because he loves them way better than you do. You see, but you can have the greatest plan and still the emotions of conflict can take over. I firmly believe you cannot do this. You cannot become self-controlled if you are not first spirit-controlled. You cannot do this. You cannot become self-controlled in the midst of conflict when the pain is real, when the words that were spoken that hurt, you can't do it unless you are surrendered to the Lord. Unless you are first spirit-controlled, you will never be self-controlled. And in the the New Testament, um, depending on your translation, between seven and 11 times, the phrase, be self-controlled, appears. I think this matters to the Lord. He says, be self-controlled. And in order to do that, we've got to have a plan and we need to be spirit-controlled. The next thing I want you to see is that we are called to become an initiator. Now, this is not an initiator of conflict. We don't need any help in that. To become an initiator means becoming someone who initiates resolution of conflict. Let's look at it in the text. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you. I want you to underline, circle, highlight. If you write in your Bible, mark that word. It doesn't say, if it is possible, whoever started it should initiate the resolution. It doesn't say, whoever sin was worse should initiate the resolution. It doesn't say whoever had the last word. It says what? If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, we are the ones who are called, whether we are the one that was wronged or the one who was wrong, we are the ones who are called to initiate resolution. As far as it depends on us, regardless of whether or not we started it. You know what this means is you're going to have to let go of the idea that conflict is going to be fair. Because it's not fair. In fact, most of life is not fair. The idea that uh, somebody wrongs me and I have to be the one to go address that is not fair, but that's exactly what we're called to. 
In order to do this, we're going to have to let go of fair, and we're going to have to be willing to begin with our part. You know, you see what I've realized is even when I think my side of the street is cleaned, it's usually not. We're going to have to begin with our part. You know how much, e- how much de-escalation happens when you come into a conflict and you begin with, I am so sorry for the words I said, for the way I treated you. I'm sorry that I made you feel that way. Even if you've got 0.5% of the problem, if you begin with, I am sorry for my part, you've just brought it from a 10 down to a 5. And the other person is far more likely to actually listen and begin resolving the issue. You've got to begin with your, car, your part. My kids hate this question, but this is the question I ask them every time there's an argument. And I got this actually from Paul and Jan. Did you do everything right? You know, if I think through my own personal conflicts, most of the time it's no. You know, even, even though the initial conflict is not, um, is not my fault, per se, it wasn't began with me, maybe my heart towards them has not been right. Or, or I've, I've desired to gossip. He says, begin with your part. Where were you wrong in this conflict? And uh, I, as I was preparing for this message this week, um, I was praying, I was pretty excited and, you know, this is just such a, an important issue, relationships and how to, how to live out a godly relationship and resolving conflict. And I began praying, Lord, what do you want me to say? Like, this is so big. We need to, we need to grow in this area. And uh, I felt the Lord say, before you say anything, there's a couple things you need to go do, buddy. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know my story. Um, from an early age, I was involved in addiction, and my life came with all the trappings of that lifestyle. Um, I was a liar. Nobody could trust me, um, especially my family members, because uh, they were the ones I took advantage of the most. And uh, I walked a very dark road. And as I'm preparing for this message, the Lord says, there's something you have not resolved yet. And he reminded me of a day over a decade ago when um, I didn't have money to fuel my addiction. So I went over to my grandfather's house, who at the time was living independently, although he had Alzheimer's and dementia. And uh, my mom was taking care of him, and, and so he was living on his own. But I went over there under the guise of, I'm going to clean for you, knowing full well that as soon as I left the room, he would forget I was there. I'm not proud to admit this, but um, I went into his kitchen, I took a canister of money, and then I left. And I used that to fuel my addiction. And then I knew that my mom was taking good care of him, so I tried to cover my tracks, and I went to my sisters, and I said, hey, um, I think mom took some money from, my, from grandpa. And as I'm reading this passage, God says, you haven't dealt with that. I had forgotten about it. He says, you haven't dealt with it. And my heart was wrecked. And last Saturday, I called my mom. And uh, I just told her, Mom, I don't even know how to begin this conversation, but there is something I need to confess to you. And she said, okay, you can tell me anything. And I was terrified. This was bringing up all of my past. And uh, I I told her, I said, Mom, when I was... um, When I was in my addiction, I, there was a day when I went over to Grandpa's house and I stole from him and then I blamed it on you. And my mom began to share with me. She said, I know the day that happened. She said, I remember. And she said, Jason, it was so difficult because I didn't know how to trust you. I didn't know how to be in relationship with you. I'm your mom, you're my son, I wanna trust you and yet here we are, I I can't trust you. In fact, I went over to grandpa's house, took the rest of his money and put it in his account because I knew you'd be back. She said, your addiction hurt me. And then she, uh, the next statement just blew me away. We were both teary-eyed and um, 
She said, I forgive you, and I don't hold it against you. And then the next thing she said just gave me chills because she said, Jason, I know that you are your own worst critic and you are gonna hold this over your head like judge, jury, and executioner. And here's what you need to know. God wants you to live at peace in our relationship. What? That's exactly what this verse says. You see, all this tension that had been building up inside of me, I was terrified to have this conversation with my mom. And when I came forward, And I was honest, and I began with my part and initiated the conversation. There was resolution, there was healing, there was peace between us, there was a restored harmony, this thing that had been festering for years that I didn't even know, she knew the whole time. And God says, before you say anything, buddy, you're gonna have to live this out. This is extremely difficult, and I don't know, I'm gonna pause real quick. In your mind, who are you thinking this message is for? You know what's really easy for me to do? When a message is difficult and challenging, it's easy for me to think, oh, this person needs to hear it. This person needs to hear it. I want you to evaluate, what is God saying to me? What is God saying to me? So we are called to be self-controlled in conflict. We are called to be initiators. The last thing I want you to see in this passage is we are called to become peacemakers. Let's look at it in the text. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love how he crafts this statement. As far, he gives distance here. Let me ask you the question, and you may want to write this down. How far am I willing to go to have peace in my relationships? Because it's going to cost you. If you're going to have peace, the interesting thing about peace is you're going to have to face into some tough conversations in order to have peace in relationships. And I believe there are two parts to being a peacemaker. The first one, is forgiveness. Forgiveness. I believe forgiveness gets a bad rap. Um, When my kids forgive me, they say, it's okay, Dad. And I always have to remind them, no, it's not okay. This was wrong. This is why Daddy needs Jesus. Can you forgive me, though? You see, I think we have a, a perspective that forgiveness is cheap, but that's not what the gospel says. See, the gospel says that forgiveness was so costly that the Son of God had to come, live a perfect life, and then be persecuted, went through a mock trial, publicly beaten and ridiculed, and then murdered. That's what it costs for you and I to get forgiveness. Forgiveness is not cheap. Forgiveness is not saying, it's okay, I'm going to sweep it under the rug. That's the last thing we need. Forgiveness is saying, that was wrong, and I am choosing to not bring it up, to not hold it against you. And I believe forgiveness is not just a momentary blip on the relationship radar. I believe it is not just a word, it is a process and it begins with that initial moment where you are going to sit down with that person who wronged you and say the words, I forgive you. That's hard. You see, I I define forgiveness this way, that I can think about the person, the wrong that they did to me, and still desire that God blesses them. Well, how do you get there when the emotion is so raw, and the pain is so real, and and the hurt is right in front of you? How do you get here? It can't just be, I'm afraid, far too often we end here, just saying, I forgive you. But that's not the end of this process. The next part is forgiving, that every time that person and the wrong done against you comes up, you are making the conscious choice to forgive. You see, forgiveness is not a feeling or emotion, it is a choice, and there will be days where you do not feel it. I know there are for me. And this one, there's no time frame on it. You see, it could take a few days, it could take weeks, it could take months, it could take decades. until you finally can come to the point where you can think about the person, 
you can think about the infraction, the sin, the wrong, the evil, and say, ah, gosh, I want God to bless them. And that's when you come to forgiven. The other part of becoming a peacemaker that I think is so crucial is that not only are we people of forgiveness, but we're people of confession. We're people of confession. Um, I had a hard lesson in this um, early in my time in family church around 2014. Uh, uh, I was reminded of another story from my addiction. A young man walked in, and as soon as I saw his face, I remembered something that I hadn't remembered in years. Um, there was a day, I was about 15 years old, and we were using in my car, several friends of mine, and we got pulled over by a police officer, and I had just enough time to shove my stuff in somebody else's bag, and I tried to pin it on him. And that wrong severed those relationships. In fact, I was in bondage to that wrong, because every time I saw those people in public, I would hide my wife, once we first got married, we moved uh, back from Spokane down to Roseburg. She said, uh, it would be like we'd be grocery shopping and all of a sudden, where's Jason? Because I was hiding. The hurt was too difficult. I didn't want to deal it. I didn't want to confess. I didn't want to face into it and initiate the conversation. So I would just hide. And I was in bondage. I was imprisoned to what I had done. And sure enough, 2014, I'm sitting in church on a Sunday morning and in walks the guy that I tried to pin everything on. And I have never experienced holy dread like that. It was terrifying. And to be honest with you, I don't remember a single thing Paul said that day. And I'm not proud of this, but my response was, God, please don't bring him back. There are plenty of other churches. Please don't bring him back. And over the next couple of weeks, he kept coming and I kept praying. In three weeks, I remember the moment it happened. We were driving to the church. We were right before the green exit. My wife is driving, and I prayed, God, please don't bring him back. And it was like the Holy Spirit cut through all the noise in my head and said, but he needs the gospel. He needs Jesus. And you're worried about how it's going to make you feel. And so you don't want him to come because you're going to be uncomfortable. You got to stop hiding. And I went to church that day knowing I had to have the conversation, that I had to confess. And uh, he was one of those that kind of bolted after service. And so I ran after him and I walked up to him. I just said, I know you know who I am. I was wrong and I am so sorry. Can you please forgive me? And he said, I forgive you and I don't hold it against you. And I realized in that moment, this festering wound that I had been in bondage to was ruling my life, and now there was freedom from it. You see, if you don't release the hurt, whether it was done against you or something that you did, if you don't release the hurt, you will just live from it. You will live imprisoned. You will live in bondage. And that day, I was set free Got a couple challenges for you, but before I do, I'm going to release to the campuses. Love you guys. The first thing I want to challenge us today is I hope, I hope God is stirring in your heart. I hope that there's something that he's brought to the surface. There is either a confession or a forgiveness that needs to happen. The first thing I want to challenge you with is to write a letter of forgiveness. Um, a couple years ago, I did this, and it was really helpful. I actually began the letter extremely angry, and I was going to let them know what I felt. And as I prayed and allowed God to be a part of the process, I wrote a letter of forgiveness instead of letting them have it. So I want to encourage you guys, this week, whatever that hurt is, whatever that pain is, maybe it's, maybe it's decades old, it still needs resolution or you'll live in bondage. Write a letter of forgiveness. The second thing I want to challenge you with is just a simple question, but a very difficult question. What do you need to confess? You see, unconfessed sin 
is unresolved conflict. Unconfessed sin is unresolved conflict. And even if the other person doesn't know that there's unconfessed sin in your relationship, it is impacting the peace in your relationship. It is impacting the harmony in your relationship. And you are in bondage to it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you love us enough to come here and die so that we can experience forgiveness from you. And God, I ask you to make us into people that are people of forgiveness and confession. Lord, we love you. This is a hard call. Please help us to live it out this week. In your name, amen. If you're watching online, either because you're sick and can't make it or out of town, or maybe you watch online regularly, let me invite you to, while we are celebrating communion here at Family Church, to take and take a few moments and celebrate communion right there in your own home, if you're able, or wherever you might be. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of a teaching on it and just kind of help us understand it. But if you have a possibility of going and getting a cup, um, picking up some crackers, a uh, loaf of bread, something that you can take and physically participate in this as we go through the process, it will be meaningful to you. And how you get the elements and what you put them in and if it's grape juice or wine or whatever you want to take, it's, those, those details really are not the point of it. The point of it is this is a spiritual exercise of, of examining ourselves, of reviewing what the truth is and the And and it's a spiritual moment that the scripture speaks of very highly. And so I'd like to lead you through that um, wherever you are right now. And if you have somebody or if you're able to to go ahead and grab some crackers and grab some juice, then when we get to the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for you just to take a few moments as we are here at Family Church and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So I'd, I'd like to read, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is writing to a church that's actually doing it all wrong, and he's kind of trying to correct them, and so he brings in some things to to bring this back to a point of worship. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So Paul wasn't there. He didn't come to be a follower of Jesus till after that. And so evidently Jesus had communicated to him that this is how he was supposed to to remember that what had happened. And so he, Paul, like us, wasn't there in person, so this is his way of reviewing and remembering that. And so it says, Jesus broke the bread, and then he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To proclaim is to to share something as true and to, to again review it and remember that. And so he's saying whenever you go through this exercise, you are reminding yourself, you are saying, wow, this is what happened. And and Jesus' body was broken for me and, and his blood was shed for me. And I am now a part of the family of of God. I am now forgiven. I am now included because of what Jesus has done. And then he goes on and gives a little warning. He said, so then whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And and he's dealing with a situation where they actually had a whole love fest, a a big feast, and and some people were coming, and they were hungry, and they were elbowing their way in, and they were getting a lot, and it it turned into a a kind of a wild party. And he was saying, man, that is dangerous. You've forgotten what this is about. But, But it's also a great reminder for you and I that before we take this moment and remember Jesus in this special way, he says, we're supposed to examine ourselves. What, what is my relationship with Christ like? Is there any sin? And I, and I think it's often appropriate just to stop and to pray and to say, God, is there anything in my life that's hindering you working? Is there, is there anybody I've offended? Is there anything that I, maybe it's a sin you clearly know that you committed and you just need to confess it. And 
maybe you think, I, I don't really think of anything that I've done specifically that was an act of sin. But you allow the Holy Spirit to point out where you've been selfish or where you've been misusing the, the resources God's given you or something that the Spirit points out. And that's, that's part of the function of not only examining yourself, as it says, but, but doing that and letting God examine you. And so there's that moment of, of kind of humility and of, of prayer and of asking God to show you and, and offering up and saying, God, thank you that your, your blood is sufficient to cover that sin too. I, I confess, I, I blow it all the time. I'm, I'm a sinful person. And thank you, God, for forgiving me. And, and, and you go through a period of time and examine and, and confess and, and kind of like clear the plate. And I, I think it's impor- important for us to do that daily, but it seems like when we celebrate communion, there's kind of a, a big moment where you're saying, okay, I want to clear my heart. And then, and then he says, we are to remember the body and blood of Christ. And I, and I think as you go through and as you take that bread, you, you think about cross. You think about Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. And, and about his body that was, he was whipped and his the crown of thorns. And, and not to become gruesome or to focus on the gory part of it, but but to realize that it, the cost that it was for him, this, this is a free gift for me, but ah, the cost was incredible. And, and, and when you think of the blood and the fact that it was shed for me, that that's the only way that sin is forgiven. And in the Old Testament, it was a lamb that was killed and the, the, the throat was slit and the blood was put on the altar. And that was a picture of the cost of sin. And so as you remember those things, you, you come to that moment of, not only soberness, but it's, it's, we call it a celebration because you're thinking, wow, this is so incredible. And so you, you take that and, and then I encourage you and, I, and I'd like to just pray with you. And then when we're done praying, whenever you're ready, you, you take that bread and you take that cup and you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I, I remember you, I take this. And you, you eat the bread and drink, the, drink from the cup and, and let it be a, a spiritual moment for you. So I'd like to lead you in prayer and... Um, If if you'd like to spend a few moments after that uh, examining your heart and seeing if God would show you anything that you need to confess and then then go ahead and eat and and drink whenever you're ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who are joining us online. And and Father, all of us have things in our life where selfishness comes in and where bitterness comes and where, where we allow fear to control us instead of you. And I ask that you would... Just lead us, God, to confess whatever it is that might hinder our relationship or you working in us. And then I ask that as we eat this piece of bread, a cracker, as we drink this juice or this wine, that that we would do it as an act of worship, remembering and reminding ourselves how valuable and how important this is and and saying how grateful we are to you. But God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us this the symbol to remind us because we are a forgetful people. In your precious name, amen. Now as the music continues, just go through that process wherever you are in that and we'll trust that this will be a special part of your worship today.